Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn How to Speak Dog webinar. It's brought to you by Wag Out Loud. My name is Krista, and I am the host of the Wag Out Loud podcast. And that's a weekly show where we are obsessed with canine health, nutrition, and overall well being. So check it out if you have not listened to it before. Um, <laughs> Excuse my background. I just wanted to let you know that I'm traveling with my husband and my dog Winston over several of the Colorado mountain passes and we are seeing amazing fall colors which are just gorgeous right now and this is a hotel with a kitchen in beautiful basalt Colorado. So, um, so glad that you're here. And for those who stick around until the end of the webinar, we're going to be doing some giveaways. So definitely stick with us. Let's get started. Um, we would love to know who's with us today. So let us know where you're from, who you are in the chat box in the lower right of your screen where it says, say something nice. If you can just let us know. So we've got um, Judy is saying hello. Who else do we have with us? We have a bunch of people. People coming in, everybody. And then as you're doing that, oh, Shelly is from Lubbock, Texas. And of course, we have Steve here. <laughs> uh, Judy, New Hampshire. JB, thanks for being here. Derby is in California. Anne is in Grand, Grand Rapids. Uh, Derek is from Grand Rapids. And J Jim, he loves Speak Dog. So you've got fans already, Steve. <laughs> Fantastic. Don from San Diego. Kelly is also from Michigan. We have JB from Portugal. That is so cool. Uh, Foz is San Francisco, Julie right around the corner from me in Lakewood, Colorado, and Jim from Tulsa. As we have people coming in, again, welcome everybody. Um, if you want to, uh, this kind of sets up this whole webinar. In the polls down at the bottom of your screen there, we'd love for you to answer that question. Is your dog 100% obedient 100% of the time? <laughs> you could let us know. Um, I'm sure everybody's going to say no, because that's why you're here. Uh, and then most importantly, I know everybody's going to have questions. So at the bottom of your screen there, you'll see ask a question. That is where you ask your question, not in this uh, comment section. And the reason for that is not only can you ask your question, but you can see other people's questions. And because we only have an hour for this webinar, you can upvote other people's questions that you see, and we'll get to those most upvoted questions first. So be sure to tag the ones that interest you most. Okay, onward. <laughs> I am so honored to have Steve Langfer with us today. He's here to talk about how to become more fluent in dog and the importance of tone, timing, and consistency. And real quick before Steve shares his words of wisdom, I wanted to let you know that I did read Steve's book just recently. I think I finished it about two weeks ago. It is amazing how I learned to speak dog. And I can't tell you, Winston, my dog, how much he has changed just from the few things that I learned and implemented right away from the book, things that we'll, you'll hear Steve talk about, but just entering and exiting a doorway. How should you do that the correct way? Should your dog be in the kitchen with you when you're cooking or when you're eating? And what should you have them do before you have them eat? There are just so many cool things. My dog being 11 years old is totally different now just by implementing these few really cool things that I learned from the speak dog philosophy. So you guys are in for a treat. Steve, thank you so much for leading this super important discussion. 
Um, I would love for you to introduce yourself and share with everyone, why are you so passionate about sharing the true language of canines? Well, thank you so much for having me, Krista. I've gotten to know you a little bit and you are truly a canine lover and uh, I admire what you do with your blog. Um, Wag Out Loud is a fantastic tool. Um, so I've gotten just to get to know you a little bit and it's really nice to become your friend and, uh, and fellow dog lovers. So thanks for having me to your blog, first of all. Yeah. And um, so, you know, guys, I, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about me. Um, so, Chris, I will just tell you this. I'm going to spend uh, just one minute telling you about, about uh, how the book, how and why the book. And then I'm going to take about two minutes uh, to fast track about, you know, uh, the 20 years of experience that, that's in the book. And then I want to spend the whole rest of time, I guess that would be 17 minutes, right? Um, I'm trying to, to provide some value to all you guys out there that are dog lovers and, and may have heard of this brand and um, give you some applicable um, information um, in this webinar. I want to ha be as, as hands-on as possible, give you as much uh, value as possible. I might have a surprise guest here today. <laughs> So, so be ready. So um, the book uh, became about because um, I made the mistake <laughs> of telling my mom that a couple organizations um, really were encouraging me to write a book. And the reason they're encouraging that is um, I, I became an expert in social rehabilitation. And I hit it for about a decade or more because um, I had another career as an engineer and um, uh, I, I had spent all so much time with with dogs. It's in the book, but from grad school on, and um, I really got um, it was a passion of mine, and um, I became really good at helping traumatized dogs. So you guys have seen uh, in the Humane Society and No Kill Shelters have really aggressive dogs, the kind that are are, are lunging at the gate uh, for anyone that approaches, and then sadly traumatized dogs. Right, so something's happened and they've been um, traumatized. They're very fearful. And anybody walks up to their cage and they might roll over, uh, might start shaking and be you know, very shy. So um, I was asked to write a book and I thought that was kind of cool, right? So uh, I want to assure you guys, I'm not the sharpest knife <laughs> in the drawer. And I'd always joked with um, people that had asked me to do this, that, hey, I, I can barely read. I, I can't write a book. Not that anybody would read, but, but thank you though. I'm really passionate about this and let's get back to the dogs. So I made the mistake of sharing that with my mom and I, any good mom, she said, you really got to do this. And true story. So a few months before she passed, long time uh, illness, funny lady, great mom. It's super good stuff. Uh, she said, hey, I really uh, I want you to promise me one thing. And, and I, I thought, I think you're up to something. And she said, no, really, I just want me to promise that you'll try. Well, you just try to do this. So. Uh, the following month, I made one single phone call, and that phone call led to a lunch, and that led lunch to, uh, to another introduction, and led to a publisher, and the, the book got done um, last year, and it went on Amazon two days before Christmas, and I'm going to fast track here, and I get this email 31 days later um, saying, congratulations, that your book has uh, become, uh, was tagged by Amazon as an international bestseller. Like, who, you guys, who would have thought? So um, it, it became um, a really, really cool thing. So... Um, that's kind of how the book got written and, um, and, and the contents in the book really comes from social rehabilitation of dogs and then, a, and then obedience training. So, um, that's what you're going to get. So now back to you, everybody that's on the webinar. So the important thing that's in the book that's really applicable is, is really in chapters nine and 10. So I'm going to fast track reading here because there's going to be so many questions and I know I'm going to run out of time. So. Uh, in chapter nine, we talk about the fact that um, our dogs, all of our dogs, all of your dogs are never going to understand Chinese <laughs> or German or any Spanish. And your dog also isn't going to understand any English. And so amazingly, uh, when I have traveled and spoke with groups, I mean, some of us, we get caught by that because we're like, well, but my dog already knows a, a few words of English. And um, so... That's when we said, well, you know, it's absurd as it is that your dog's going to understand any Chinese. It's equally absurd that your dog's going to understand uh, any English. So our dogs don't actually know what the word sit uh, means. So 
one of my dogs is not here is one of the smartest dogs that I've ever owned. And um, I've, I've trained her or conditioned her that when I say stand, she sits and I praise her for it. When I say sit, she stands and I, and I praise her for it. People are like, well, that's really funny. Yeah, it's cute, but she's actually, she's doing, she's doing it wrong. She's doing it opposite. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, she's doing exactly uh, what I've trained her to do. She's doing exactly what I asked her to do. She's doing exactly what I've conditioned her to do. And that's really we get into what is the language of dogs? If they don't know what we're saying, then how is it, right, that, that we can have these relationships and, and they actually can follow some commands? So it all goes back to Pavlov's law. And you guys can all look at it on your own. But, uh, you know, the Russian scientist, right, big dog lover and – um, as the story goes, it's all factual that um, one night when he rang the dinner bell, right, all of his dogs uh, came running through his property and, and salivating for dinner. And being a scientist, he, asked, he just wondered, like, you know, I wonder, though, I mean, do they know that it's dinner time um, or are they salivating because of the bell? So the next day at noon, you know, the story, he rings the bell in the middle of the day and all the dogs come running and salivating. He's like, wow. They don't know it's dinner time, right? They've been conditioned to this bell. And it led to a whole slew of um, studies on Pavlov's law, right? Stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response. So the relevance for you and I is um, that because our dogs do not know what we're saying, because they don't know what we're saying, right? They're so efficient at Pavlov's law. Some of us have really smart dogs, right? So you might be thinking like you have a German Shepherd. Or you have an Australian Shepherd. You know, some of these, some of these breeds are really smart, right? They're really smart. And what do we mean by that? You know, what is a smart dog? So, what we really mean to be saying to each other is, you know, my dog is smart. My dog is efficient. My dog is efficient in Pavlov's law, right? Stimulus response, stimulus response. And the way that we can help them be uh, efficient and smart is really to speak their language. So. Their language is all about tone, timing, and consistency. So tone, timing, and consistency. Okay. So at the very beginning, this is going back now 30 years when I had my first big dog and I had the opportunity to go to a training institution uh, with the Indiana State Police, right? There's a master canine trainer that was there, a friend of my parents' vet, and as I'm sitting there um, uh, as a grad student, right? So I'm fancy pants. I'm a smart guy. I'm a, I'm a graduate business student. And, but I'm sitting there listening to this, this um, German fella um, barking commands at these dogs. And everything was in German. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I, I don't know a word he's saying. And yet these dogs, he's got these dogs wrapped right around his finger, Right. They're like, they're like uh, uh, waiting and you know, beat a breath, right? Every, every, every syllable, every word, like, you know, he's got their attention. And all he has to do is say something um, and, you know, they're on it. They move, they, they react, right? I mean, but I'm thinking to myself, this is interesting because I don't know what he's saying. And if I don't know what he's saying as a fancy pants graduate student, these dogs don't know what he's saying. They don't know what he's saying. So how is he pulling this off? And that led into my journey um, it, um, as far as, you know, what, what's happening here, what's happening here. And the answer was, it, it's tone. So side note to self, tone is not always audible. So it, it is most often audible. We, we communicate through tones with the dogs. But it, it, it can be um, expression, facial expression, right? And it can be um, other tones like touch. So sometimes we'll communicate with dogs through um, um, audible tone, right? Visual tone and touch tone. So someone's going to have some questions on that. So the key in communicating with dogs, because they don't know any dialect of human, right? They don't know Chinese and they don't know any German. They don't know Spanish and they don't know English. So how we bridge that gap is through tone. And um, in Speak Dog, we help people get started by saying, hey, it's, it's easier for the, for the dog to have three tones. So you'll want to make a, a note on this. This will help you, I promise. It will fast track your relationship and fast track all your, all your training. The three tones that we want to have is praise, pretty self-explanatory, right? So we, it's encouraging. We want it to be um, calm and stable. Most dogs don't need to be, you know, oh, yeah, 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 really good, you know over, overly praised. But we have um, praise. We have instruction. 
which is um, godly, confident, right? Instructional, commanding. And then we have corrections. So I'm not going to belabor a whole lot, but we do want to be able to communicate with the dog through um, tones. And the more distinct and separate those tones are, remember, they can, you can speak dog through any dialect of human, right? We can speak dog through Chinese and we can speak dog through German and Spanish and of course English. But the more we differentiate our tones, the easier the dog is going to be able to understand um, what's good, what's preferred, what's encouraged, and then what's not. So praise is pleasant, instruction is commanding, and then um, correction is just that. It's unpleasant, it's correctional, it's always one syllable. If you're taking notes, uh, we never, not very many always numbers, we never use the dog's name for corrections. You moms out there are going to struggle here. So when my mom was really mad, she would say, Stephen Vincent Langfer. And I knew she was really upset, right? Not average upset, really upset. So don't do that because your dog doesn't know that you're upset if you layer on the, the words. We always want it to be uh, one syllable. So it, it has to be correctional, but we want it to be one, one syllable. I'm giving you a lot here. You guys are going to have questions, but why? Like, don't say, you know, hey, I said stay out of the garbage. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. And the reason that we don't want to do that is because we, we want the dog's brain to perceive you as a source of stability. Okay? So dogs are drawn to stability, and they tend to veer away from what they perceive as instability. So there's your tones, and I'm going to move on to um, – uh, the, the rest of the, the chapter 10 in the book, which is really the, the bean potatoes. So we want to communicate through tones. They will learn some sounds. They will learn some words, um, but they don't understand uh, sarcasm or sense of humor. They'll never understand full sentences. And so I, someone's going to ask, well, what about the, someone's already asking questions. What about the dogs that learn 300 things? Okay. We'll talk about that um, yeah, at, at, at the end, right? So, uh, tone and then timing. So the best way to communicate with a dog in any, t in any tone, right, is in the act of. Dogs are understand a whole lot more if we communicate with them in the act of, right? So um, tone is necessary, right? Um, timing is everything. Now, we've heard that to each other. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. Timing is everything, you guys. So the dog is going to... Um, understand what you like and what's being corrected if it's done with um, perfect timing, which is really yeah, in the act of. And the last thing with uh, their language, where are you going, Peanut, um, is, um, is consistency. Okay, so tone, timing, and consistency. It's consistency is important because it fast tracks everything. Okay, you're, you're gonna, we all mess up, right? But um, consistency is important because it provides the dog uh, continuity, right? So, so when this happens, stimulus, right? Then I get praised, right? Response, right? So stimulus response, stimulus response. And the more consistent we are with our dogs, um, the faster they learn um, and the more sound um, the relationship actually, right? So over the 20 years, um, as I got more and more into doing um, social rehabilitation, right, with um, broken dogs, very broken dogs, the most extreme aggressive dogs that you've heard of, right, um, and the most incredibly damaged, broken, physically abused, traumatized, fearful, trembling dogs. So the cool part about um, speaking their language is that um, the process is the same. So the process is the same. You guys, it's, it's so powerful. So what is this process that I'm talking about? Well, over the 20 years, um, I have observed from the dogs that there's 100 plus ways that dogs communicate together, okay? Be clear, I am not talking about alpha and I'm not talking about physical submission, okay? There's 100 plus ways that dogs interact and communicate with each other to choose, um, establish social order, okay? And so what I did, um, because they were so effective when I was working with the dogs, I'm like, uh, I, I rebundled them, you know, into these seven sacred ways. I'm going to go through them with you very quickly. 
Um, they're all equally beneficial. They're all equally powerful. It, it all de depends on um, the dog and on the situation. So let's go through these seven sacred ways real quick, and then I can um, answer the questions. I'm going to set the table first. Okay. The reason that they were labeled the, the, the seven sacred ways is because these are ways that, that you can love and lead your dog so these are ways that you can love and lead your dog and be able to place yourself or assert yourself neurologically as their canine leader. This is very powerful. It can happen very quickly when I'm visiting a dog that's hyper aggressive. Okay, so we show up and I, I love and lead. I'm, I'm doing um, one or more of these seven ways. And the dog in me kind of look, looks back like, you know, you speak my language. Right. And confidently, I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to lead him in these ways by being able to um, get proficient at these seven sacred ways. Right. You're going to be able to place yourself neurologically as a leader. The reason so significant is dogs have an innate biological need for social structure. We all know they're pack animals, but so are elephants. They run in a herd. They're mammals, right? So are horses. Um, uh, you know, elephants in a in a tribe, horses in a herd. Uh, dolphins are mammals. They run in a, they run in a pod. Canines are a little different. Okay, so there's more significance um, in some ways to canines. There's a biological need for social order and leadership. Okay, so when we provide that, we're really providing a home for the dog. This is home, you guys. So we talk about in the book that they don't even know what a roof is. They don't know what carpeting is, and they don't care about either, right? So there are many dogs out there, you might know some, that live in mansions uh, with a really loving family. Uh, and in some ways, the dog's completely homeless, right? So uh, no one speaks the dog's language. Um, the dog has some anxiety in some ways, et cetera, et cetera. The dog is crazy um, all the time. There's no obedience, right? There's, there, it doesn't listen. Um, busts through the door, knocks down the kids. It's just a fun, fun, fun dog, but it's totally out of control. And a lot of times, you know, this is a dog that might be a little bit socially broken, and this is a dog that's homeless, despite the beautiful home that we might recognize. Okay. I'm going to run through the seven second ways. Uh, Krista, you can keep me on track here. So... Um, so they're in no particular order. You're so, good. Why don't you just go for, you know, another seven minutes or so. Got it. Here we go. The seven sacred ways in seven minutes. Never done this before. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Krista. So doorways are the difference. So doorways are the difference. So all dogs, you'll see this on all of our videos. You'll be blown away, right? When you go ahead and assert yourself lovingly, you assert yourself as a leader at an exterior door with a does for relationship, right? So all dogs, wreck it. they don't know that they know, okay? But there's something special about extra doors. It goes back to, to puppies in a den, you guys. Um, it's a safety thing. So if you'll lead uh, with extra doors, you'll be able to assert yourself or play your, yourself neurologically as a leader. Um, dining etiquette, this one's simple, okay? Uh, it's the exchange of food. It could be regularly scheduled meals or treats, tricks and treats, tricks and treats, right? The delivery of food is significant to a dog, okay? Most of us have heard this or know this. And the reason why um, is we don't want even domesticated dogs, we do not want our dogs to get physically or neurologically fixated on the food in our presence, okay? It's a disservice to the dog, right? So you're going to love and lead, you're going to require that dog to not get fixated, right, physically or neurologically, and to look to you for permission before it takes the treat, right, or before it eats its scheduled meals. Invite only. So this is really a, a popular one. <laughs> so well, one of the most common things is how do we get our dogs to stop jumping up on us, right? So invite only applies to dogs jumping up on us. It applies to our couch. It applies, applies to our bed. Um, all of which I'm okay with. Um, it, it, there's nothing wrong um, with having um, our pack members, you know, be able to jump up on us when invited or on our couch when invited or on a bed. The problem is when we allow dogs uninvited to jump up on us or on a couch or a bed, we're giving them social placement with regard to us, right? Um, 
that isn't in their best interest. So we're telling the dog something about our relationship. We'll come back to that. So invite only, right? The dog cannot uh, jump up on us. It would never happen in the wild or in their natural state, right? So if a young gung-ho pup jumped up on the lead dog in the wild, there would be a major physical correction. It does not happen. It does not happen in their natural state. Um, stop touching me. You ever been in the back seat of a car? Anybody guys have siblings and you drive your parents nuts because you're t touching in the ear and you're poking and kissing and smooching and tickling or pinching or whatever, punching. And, um, you know, like, oh, your mom, you know, Steve's touching me. It's just on and on and on and it goes on, right? So there's something about um, space and proximity. And dogs have a language all their own, specifically about touch, okay? We just need to be aware that they do have a language of touch. And you will see all the time, I just did a, 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 a little training at a, at a veterinarian clinic uh, here in Michigan a few days ago, and there's a little French bulldog um, that, that literally came and kind of nudged his head into me and walked away. I'm like, you rascal. So I, I tickled him on the butt. He turned around, came back and headbutted me again and walked away. So I tickled him on the, on the butt. He turned around, came back, you know, three separate times. All right, so socially assertive, strong-willed dogs, like th there's communication going on and we need to be aware of that. So um, we'll come back to uh, touching me. What's yours is mine. So this is one of the ones I'm most adamant about. So your dog doesn't have his or her own bed. Your dog doesn't have a favorite toy, like, you know, their own food bowl. It's really important that we as loving leaders recognize that uh, it's all yours, right? The, the dog wants it that way. So what's my, what's, what's yours is mine. <laughs> Who's probably right here on the dog? It's your ball. It's your tug toy. This is how we train dogs at the airports, right? To find rugs. We have the tug toy, right? They want it so bad. But just go to the airport and watch. You will always see in the back pocket. There is either going to, you know, there's going to be a touch. It's not food. It's never food, right? So what's yours is mine. Everything, your ears, your tail, your teeth, what's yours is mine, period, with period. Um, stay away from the kill or keep away from the kill. This is six. There's just two more. It's different than dining etiquette. So you got to be careful of what you're telling your dog socially um, when you're preparing food. Think of your grill on the patio. Think of preparing food in the kitchen, okay? A lot of times we'll see dogs um, as they get into, you know, a year and a half, two, they'll be in the kitchen, you know, leaning, leaning right up on you, touch, right? And it's always oh, such a good boy, right? So we'll give them a piece of food and whatnot. And they're in the proximity of food preparation, you know, and then all of a sudden out of the blue, we don't know what happened, but our sweet little golden retriever Susie, she, she bit one of our kids, Right. Well, these are things that can happen with dogs. So how we treat them socially in the preparation of food, your grill, your kitchen, you got to be careful because you can be communicating with the dog, you know, their social placement uh, placement. And then the last one, number seven, is migrating is magic. Like we all know this. Right. So how you walk together. I mean, people are being pulled all around cities all across the country. Right. Um, it just, it, some dogs pull harder than others. And how do we get the dog to stop pulling? Right. So it's to, to the dog, once we're moving with intention beyond proximity, like a driveway, mailbox, whatnot. Okay. When you're moving with intention, um, how you're walking or migrating with the dog, um, tells the dog your relationship. It's a very powerful tool. So one of the first things that I do even though it's number seven today, when we're working with traumatized dogs or aggressive dogs, the first thing I do is I, I, I go I go for you know two, three, four miles, and that dog and I, right, we walk together. Um, and that dog walks behind, right, beside or behind me. Now we have to talk about, we have to manage the dog with tone and timing, but that dog, I, I'm telling that dog, you, you'd never step ahead of me, ever, right? So when we get back from a four mile walk to the Humane Society or No Kill Shelter, we, now we have a relationship. So the important about, thing about all these sacred seven ways to love and lead, these sacred seven ways to assert yourself, right, place yourself neurologically, is it creates your relationship, okay? In all obedience, here's the, here's the bottom line. So all obedience with canines is a function of relationship, okay? All obedience is a function of relationship. So if you want to have a dog that's 100% obedient, 100% of the time, right? It's critical 
that that dog recognizes us, not as a best friend or a sleeping buddy, but that if we can, we want that dog to recognize us, like neurologically, chemically in the brain as our canine leader. And if you're able to do that, um, it completely uh, changes the relationship. So Krista, I'm gonna stop right there and, um, and, and see if I've lost anybody, or if I got you. I know you've got a couple comments that you wanted to make on some of the content in the book. So I'm gonna stop right there and converse with you. Well, yeah, I, I, as I said, I, I love this book. And when I put some of these modalities to work on Winston, it, it's just been snowballing. Um, you know, I mentioned to you that I'm on a road trip here and just taking him out to the, to a city, Crested Butte, Colorado, everybody has a dog. Yeah. And he just walked down the sidewalk. And when another dog came, he would look at me first Interesting. What should I do now, mom, leader, person? <laughs> uh, and I was just like, whose dog is this? You are wow. so well behaved. And I just, wow. I, it's so cool. So um, people, again, at the bottom of your screen, you see ask a question. That's where we would love for you to ask your questions. And they are coming in. So um Thank you, Steve, for that amazing presentation. And I encourage everybody to read this book because uh, Steve just barely, barely scratched the surface on what you can learn from it. But as I said in the beginning, we have some giveaways. And I'm excited that Steve <laughs> and the team are going to be giving away a signed copy of the book. So when Steve first started talking, you just need to fill in the blank and whoever uh, gives us the right answer first gets a signed copy. So Steve mentioned that a dog's language is all about tone, timing, and blank. So whoever comes in first with the answer, tone, timing, and consistency, JB. All right, way to go, JB. So JB will get a copy of Steve's book. All right, we're gonna go to some questions. Are you ready, Steve? I'm ready. All right, first one we have, how do you manage to train dogs when there are inconsistencies with or among the family members? Which is a really good question. That's a great question. So it's a, it's a common question. So thanks for asking that question. Um, you're going to answer some of it on your own. So um, obedience is a function of relationship. Okay. So you can't take um, your relationship with your dog um, and transfer it to somebody else. Okay. And somebody else cannot ruin your relationship with your dog. That's the good news. Okay. So if you're able to be a little more fluent in your dog's language and you are an intelligent human being, JB, so you can, you can, Play, you can learn how to place yourself neurologically as that dog's leader. By the way, not just your dog. You'll find, like Chris is suggesting, it'll rub off on your neighbor's dog, right? Uh, you, you know, you'll be able to do some things to speak their language. But on your dog specifically, nobody in the family, if you do these things consistently, right? So tone, timing, consistency with these seven sacred ways, um, you're going to, I mean, you're going to bloop, 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 bloop. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna get yourself you know snuck in neurologically that dog's brain you know as their leader they're gonna look at you differently and no one else's relationship can can affect your relationship unfortunately some people ask well how do I get my dog right to behave for my aunt and my uncle like how do I get my dog to walk behind uh, my children or walk behind my spouse and the answer is you guys it's 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 all based on relationship so we can train dogs. Uh, we certainly can, right? So we, we have therapy dogs, we have blind dogs, we absolutely can train dogs, but we have to train the people on how to use the dog. And that's great for, I know I have a pet sitter, so when we're out of town and they have to watch Winston, I have to share with them how he works now. <laughs> yeah, it's great stuff. All right, thank you for that question. Um, next we have, I think it's Dalen or Dalen. I'm so sorry. Uh, sh they are asking, do you have any tools or suggestions for training deaf dogs? Yeah, 
That great question. So you know, d dogs that don't have all five of their senses, usually it's either they're blind or they're deaf, right? So your dog is. I'm understanding this right, Chris. It's deaf. A deaf dog. That's what they're asking us. Deaf okay, dogs. Yeah. So so your dog still has the, um, their vision, I, I presume, and uh, and by the way, they still have their sense of feel. So um, we can train dogs and communicate with working breeds um, th through just a sense of feel, right? So we can. Um, my computer's gonna move, but we can, right? We can tap the ground, you know, and we can communicate through um, through so through um, sound waves or waves. But if your dog still has their vision, um, all dogs that were trained for obedience, we we train with um, audible and visual. So sometimes you might say to our dogs, you know, we'd say, you know, name, sit, right? Or in my case, all my commands are in Spanish. Of course, my dogs are not bilingual. Even though they can sit to you know to, to both languages, they're not even lingual, right? They don't really know if I'm speaking Spanish or English or when I switch back and forth. And this is, comes back to the question: it's because I use a, a, a visual symbol. So whether I'm saying uh, name, sentar, or sentase, right, or sit down, or sit, right, the visual for me is to sit. Um, so. The dog right here is looking right at me attentively because I'm speaking in a different tone and I'm saying words that, that he is familiar with. Um, so visual is every bit as powerful as audible. And if you're consistent, it's actually easier and more powerful. So you're not at a disadvantage. Uh, you have the sense of, of feeling and you have a sense of vision. And so um, just be consistent with your visual commands. Great. All right. Next, we have Julie, and Julie is asking, "How do we get our dog to ignore other dogs when walking?" Mm. So, I don't know what kind of a dog it is, and I don't know how old the dog is, right? But there's a, a saying that I love that really annoys people, and the saying is, um, "Elephants do elephant things." Like, Steve, gosh darn it, you do these weird things. I know you're making a point. You're really annoying me. Like, what does it mean? I'm like, elephants do elephant things, right? So canines do canine things. You guys, we, you, if you have a puppy, I mean, don't don't call. I can't, I can't stop the puppy from being a puppy. It's going to eat. It's going to run around. It's going to poop. It's going to do things. It's going to do puppy things. The only point I'm trying to make is... Uh, we can never stop our dogs from being dogs, right? They're going to be stimulated um, by certain things in the world, right? So to answer your question, it, it, it all comes back to relationship. So I would suggest to you that um, you're going to have a blast. I mean, if this dog is getting um, interested or worse yet, fixated when it sees other dogs, this is a huge opportunity for you. Like you're going to be blown away. Um, if you're able to... Um, become a little more fluent in canine. This is tone, timing, and consistency. And once you get proficient, right, in tone and timing and consistency, you're going to be able to start asserting yourself in these seven circular ways, which, by the way, encompass a hundred things with dogs. It's so powerful. And your dog is going to completely look at you differently. And I promise you this. I don't know who this is, but Chris, I'll find out from you afterwards. I, when you're on that walk, here's what's going to happen. When you become a little more fluent in canine, and because you're an intelligent human being, you're going to be able to place yourself neurologically as their leader, here's what your dog's going to do. It's going to see something and then look to you, right? It's going to, you know, it's going to see something and get, you know, get really fixated, and then it's going to look to you, unlike it ever has before, because all dogs do, you guys. All dogs do. Now, there are different breeds, and some of the more, some of the more difficult breeds are um, the the pulling breeds like the, the, the Husky, the Malamute, body-driven um, can be difficult breeds, exception every rule. And then the Hounds, right? So those two breeds, you know, they're, they're ridiculous. But all dogs, all dogs, including them, right? If you can be consistent and you can get yourself asserted neurologically, the dog is going to change. The dog is going to look to you because it's wired that way. It has an innate biological need for social order and leadership. And if you'll take that on that role, um, it is going to look to you instinctively for permission or instruction. In this case, per permission. 
It's just going to happen. And you are going to laugh or cry, happy tears. And you're going to be like, this is so crazy cool. I never thought this could happen. Our dog is completely out of control. It's like your dog might be living, forgive me, right? it, it might be living a little bit in a leadership vacuum. You know what? Learn canine. Become that leader, right? That stress and anxiety of not having one is going to go away, right? So this is my tough love. I mean, uh, nobody loves dogs more than I do. Um, but I also love people as much or more, in part because I'm supposed to, right? So tough love is worth it, you guys. They're never going to understand Chinese, and they're never going to understand English. So if we really love our dogs, if we really love anything or anybody, um, you know, there's books on men are from Mars and women from Venus, right? The five love languages, right? We all know that if you really love somebody, um, you'll make an effort to, to learn their language, um, right? And this could, couldn't apply more to dogs. Um, the stress and anxiety that some dogs have, including shelter dogs that you know, we've worked with over the decades, when you show up, when you show up and speak their language, it's just like children in a classroom. This is chapter 11, the last chapter of the book, right? I promise you, if Krista showed up with her lady friends in a classroom full of third graders who are all Chinese and they only speak Mandarin, just follow me here. Krista is, she's very attractive. Like she's a cute woman, right? She's so such a sweet person. It comes right through the screen, right? Her voice is nurturing. Her hair is soft. These kids don't know what she's saying, but they're going to trust Krista and her friends. They're going to want to sit in their lap, maybe brush their hair. Everybody's going to like Krista. Everybody does like Krista, especially children. But if I walked in the room 10 minutes later with some of my hockey buddies after a hockey game, uh, not smelling as good as Krista, not having the nurturing voice that Krista has, but if I walk in, you guys, and I said, Shang Shang Shi, assuming that I spoke Mandarin, and they're going to be like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, like he speaks Chinese. Assuming that I did, I'd be like, yes, I do. Um, how are you today? And they're going to be like, wow. Now, they're not going to run to me and sit in my lab because I don't smell good. And, I, you know, my voice isn't nurturing. I'm not nearly as cute as Krista by, by all. But if 10 minutes later, the principal walked in, and then I'll wrap this up. Now, this is a, this is a, a traumatizing example, but on purpose, right? So if, if someone with authority in that culture, maybe the principal, uh, perhaps a male figure, and said, hey, attention, attention, emergency. All of your parents are missing. We don't know where they are. We don't know what's happening. You have to line up at two doors immediately. This door with Krista or this door with Steve. Move now. Go, 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 go. Traumatizing. But the children are going to look at Krista like, listen, I, I do like you. I, 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 mean, I trust you. But I don't know a word you're saying. Steve speaks my language. And in this situation, because it's urgent, I'm going to, I'm going to follow Steve. He speaks my language. Right. So this is what happens with dogs um, when we show up and we speak their language um, you know, fluently. They're like the, the anxiety with aggressive dogs and the anxiety of fear uh, with um, traumatized dogs. <sighs> right. It just goes away. And now we can sneak our way in neurologically. Now we can build a relationship and we can love and lead them. And all obedience is a function of relationship. So great questions. Thank you, Steve. Okay. So I'm just going to take another second here to do another giveaway because uh, Steve is actually giving away three books. So this will be two out of three. When Steve was speaking, he said, never use a dog's blank for corrections. Ooh. So first person to answer that question, fill in the blank, never use a dog's blank for corrections. Name, Dawn, yeah. Way to go, Dawn, you are <laughs> correct. Never use a dog's name for corrections. Thank Way you. to go, Dawn. And Krista, if you don't mind, I just wanna say, hey, um, congratulations, Dawn. And yes, you guys, you could change your dog's name tomorrow. I know you won't. Um, and and re the dog really wouldn't care. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? So when I've rescued dogs, I've always changed their name. Okay, the dog that's right below me, 
it was a, a rescue project, right? This is a, um, it's a rescue dog. I'll save the story for another time, but we want to reserve that word, that sound, um, that word, their name for praise uh, and instruction. We want to reserve that name for praise and instruction. Okay. It'd be pretty simple. We never want to use the dog's name for correction because we want the dog, when it hears its, that, that word for instruction and praise, um, right? So this is, this is positive reinforcement, positive reinforcement. So that word, that sound is going to have some power with the dog, but, but not like the value of names to us, but we want a positive, uh, strong, strong positive association with that word, that sound. We never use the dog's name. Um, for correction, we want to use a one-syllable um, uh, correction. Good job, Dawn. Yeah. Steve, before we take more questions, um, where do treats and clickers and e-collars come into play or don't they? Yeah. So they do, right? So the, these, these, this is my opinion, strong opinion. So we created these man-made devices, guys, I'm talking about, and I'm, I'm not against any of them. I'm not against any of them, but you gotta understand uh, what, what they are from the dog's perspective, right? So we create these special harnesses, uh, special harness, special harness, special leash, you know, a clicker, a clacker. Um, we're gonna have an, um, a prong collar, you know, an, an e-collar. I mean, you know, we have all these devices that we create so that we can physically restrain or control our dogs because we don't know how to physically restrain and control our dogs, right? So it, the, the problem with all of these devices is they don't rely on relationship, right? Which we all know, God help us, you know, that's, that's the long way, right? To have a great marriage, to have a good relationship with your children, to have a great relationship with your coworkers. I mean, it's a pain in the ass. It's tough work, you guys. It's, it's a lot of work, right? Relationships are work. And this is not a whole lot different. Um, it takes time and events, time and events, time and events. But man, is it rewarding. Because um, as a lot of you have seen, I mean, our working dogs and, and, and a lot of dog trainers, you know, they, they don't have their dogs on physically restrained because um, they're on recall all the time, right? So it's to build a relationship. So the only disadvantage of those things is that um, we're going around the requirement for, um, uh, for a relationship. And there will always be, guys, I promise, it's just like the example of the dogs fixated on the dogs, okay? If you don't have a strong relationship, which you can only have by speaking their language, okay? There will be a stimulus in the world that has a higher value reward to your dog than a treat or whatever else you're using, right, for, for praise. There will squirrel, squirrel, that's the standing joke, right? Um, there will be, in the world world, there will be a stimulus that has a higher value reward to your dog than food. So that's the answer. So here's the good news, though, you guys. This is what we know about canines. There is no higher value reward to a canine than recognition or praise from its leader. If, if it has one, okay? And that's really the power of speak dog. There's a saying that I love um, that you guys, some of you might appreciate, even though we're all dog lovers, and that is, um, what is it? What is it that babies cry for and men die for? Recognition. Babies cry for it and men will die for it. And it just so happens that it's a powerful thing with dogs too. So recognition or praise to a, to a dog, there, there, there is no higher value reward to a dog than recognition or praise from its leader but you got to be the leader and that's that's the important part here and that's the that's the, what breaks my heart when i see restraining devices and clickers and clackers and treats and et cetera, et cetera is that we're we're, we're we're getting around the work of having a relationship 
and we're never gonna we're, we're never gonna be secure that our instructions, our commands, and our praise are what the dog yearns for because we're using these other things. Makes sense. So you probably answered this already, but this has been an upvoted question. Um, I miss socializing my German Shepherd and Border Collie when they were puppies. We are a big active family, so the dogs are sweethearts with us everywhere, but they are uncontrollable walking, riding in a vehicle, barking at neighbors and guests in and around our home, and even biting at the pant legs of our lawn company employees. At this point, we are considering a socializing restart with muzzles, but if that muzzle comes off, we're worried. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And, and as a matter of fact, um, this weekend, I'm, I will be training with a client with an Australian Shepherd that's two years old and it's, it's starting to bite and nip um, at the back of the legs, right? So, well, it's an Australian Shepherd. This is what I do, uh, um, uh, right? It's so, like, well, it's what you do with permission or instruction. So for this question, the, 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 I'm going to answer on a couple different levels, but um, level number one, this is so much easier said than done, but this is really important to believe. So immersion is better than, um, uh, that's the word I want to look for. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, isolation, right? Immersion is always better than isolation. So with isolation, the problem will get worse and worse and worse. I know it's easier. I know it's safer, okay? So the question is, well, how do we do this then? But let's start start there. So immersion is always better than isolation. Isolation will not help. It will make the problem worse over time. Um, so just we all have to say, okay, okay, gosh, I can't, I can't, I can't isolate this dog its entire life. Um, it's going to get more broken, right? So that being said, how do we do it? And um, we need to start um, building a relationship where the dog is looking to us for permission instruction. Well, that's great, Steve. That sounds wonderful, but how do we do it? Well, here's the tough love, you guys. All relationships are based on two things. So I am not a preacher nor qualified. Like God knows I am not uh, a preacher. But um, all relationships, though, all human relationships, so our relationship with God and our relationship with our dogs and our relationship you know, with each other, it's all based on two things, time and events, time and events. There's no way around this. Time and events. Okay, so you got to spend the time and the events, um, you know, with this dog. Um, there's no way around it. So that that's another level. And then specifically, I would start with um, people that the dog knows, and I would start, you know, gradually bringing people in. Um, that's what I would do. The dog is not all of a sudden out of the blue doing this. That's, that's the other thing. And it, dogs don't do that. It's never happened. Never has. You know, we get phone calls all the time that, you know, hey, 911, all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, Sally, our golden retriever, bit somebody. We, we just don't know what to do. What, you know, what's wrong with her? What are we going to do? Are we going to put, you know, we have to euthanize her? You know, oh, my Lord. Well, the good news is that didn't happen. It never happens all of a sudden out of the blue. No dog does that. It's not how they're wired. So what's happening is somehow <laughs> now this question, I'm sensitive because you've got two very difficult breeds there. So, you know, and then and if they're together, right, they are fluent in canine. This is for this, for this person's question. These two dogs, they're fluent in canine. And I don't know which dog is more socially assertive it does not mean aggressive. But we evaluate dogs and how socially assertive are they and then how socially passive are they. They're born this way. And then how neurologically stable and how neurologically unstable is the dog. So I don't know which of these two dogs is more socially assertive. But here's what I do know is these two dogs, this, this Border Collie and this German Shepherd, they are fluent in canine. They don't even know what they know, but they are fluent in canine. And how one dog perceives that owner is rubbing off on the other dog. So it's critical. This is a situation I would say is critical. Like, you know, um, I would say for this person, if you can get a hold of me, uh, do that and let's have a conversation because we want to work on the most assertive dog first. Okay. Because the other dog's keying off that. Keying off what? Keying off how the dog perceives you, your wife, your kids, whatever the situation is. 
how that one dog perceives you is going to is going to rub off into the dog. Okay, um, so there's that. But we've got to start with the assertive dog, and we got to um, start immediately doing exercises with timing events. It's, um, and we have to monitor this dog's um, behavior. We have to praise good behavior, right? In the act of. So when we see good behavior, we're going to praise it. We're going to speak their language, you know, immediately. In the act of, we're going to praise it. And behavior that we don't like it could be hair going up, could be leaning forward, could be a fixation, right? We're going to one syllable correct it, right? We may have to touch the dog if, it, if it's getting too physically fixated too quickly. So we would synchronize, you know, our uh, verbal correction with, with, a, with a touch, get the dog focused on us. When the dog focuses on us, what do you think we're going to do? No, we're not going to give it a treat. <laughs> we're going to neurologically praise it. Okay? We're going to love and lead in their language. Time and events, time and events. I hope I didn't go around too many times there. Um, Cause that's a tough situation and um, um, using these seven sacred ways on that more assertive dog, like right away. Last word of encouragement is um, for someone like this, you don't need to schedule uh, three hours a day of dog training. Cause um, I didn't mention it. So, you know, these seven sacred ways, they're happening all the time, you know, during the day already, you're already going through doors, you're already feeding the dog, right? So there's, there, these things are already happening. If you're willing to learn what they are, right, they're happening during the day. You don't have to schedule time. So you can, you can um, become more fluent canine and assert yourself neurologically, right, in your dog's brain, just through daily life, just through daily life. Obedience training takes practice. But having a healthy relationship and getting yourself placed neurologically as your dog's canine leader, um, you can do that just through normal activities during the day. Thank you, Steve. All right, um, before we do our last giveaway and as we are wrapping up, I just wanna remind you that if you don't win one of the books, How I Learned to Speak Dog, it is available on Amazon and you can go there and check out all the great reviews. I have yet to do mine, I need to. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Steve, we, so appreciate you for hanging out with us today and teaching us some great life enhancing information for both ourselves and our dogs. Where can everyone learn more about you? Well, I'm so thankful for you having me on this blog. I, I, I think you do, are doing a great service to dogs and people. And so we're giving everybody this promotion on here that uh, they can get um, the video curriculum and, and everybody, the reason we have a video curriculum is you, you can't learn to speak German by reading English out of a book. And this is very much the same way. You got to hear it and see it, hear it and see it. So we're making a special offer. We have our basic subscription for a whopping $49. So across the nation because of COVID, um, it's been a great, great thing. Um, and we're going to give it to you for 50% off. So... Um, anybody, anybody that's on here and um, anybody that you can give this code to, the code is wag out loud, one word, wag out loud. And uh, through this weekend, uh, you and yours can get this um, the program for 50% off. Okay. Wow. You're giving away even more. You told me 24 hours, but now it's going through the weekend. All right. Oh, so I, I yep. I, yep. If I said it, if I said it, I mean it. There I go again. Well, there goes. So I just again. cut and paste that information, and then also, you guys, you'll see that green button at the bottom. Uh, that is the same thing with the offer. Just use that code WAG out loud and get fifty percent off of the Speak Dog Leadership Training Basics subscription. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate that. So, if you want to get a, in touch with Steve, you just have to go to learnhowtospeakdog.com. I will also put that in the comments. So you guys have to reach out to Steve and find out more because there is more to learn. Let's do our one giveaway right now. The last one, the last book. All right. It's another fill in the blank. If you guys are ready, all obedience is about blank. Obedience is all about blank. Who is going to be the first person to answer that, do that fill in the blank? That's a good one. Yeah, all of you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Derby. Derby got relationship. 
Wow, we got some great winners. Thank you, everybody. Wow, that's awesome. Okay. Hey, Krista, uh, I'm going to offer just real quick, too. If anybody has a yeah. question, I know we're, we're right at the end here, but if you have a, a, an immediate question, you can send that question to me um, at steve at learnhowtospeakdog.com. That's the my, my email. So from this webinar, maybe put in the, su put in the subject, um, wag out loud. So steve at learnhowtospeakdog.com. And I'll, I'll get back with your question right away. Awesome. Okay. I just put that also in the comment section. Alrighty. Uh, we do have some more questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and get to those, but for those that have to jump off now, cause we are at the one hour, I want to thank everybody for being here today and really wanting to be proactive in enhancing the bond with your dog. I would love to know if everyone found value in this webinar and maybe if there's just one thing that you learned that you're going to take away, if you can add that to the comment box, you know, something that you're going to try with your dog or that really resonates. We'd love to know that uh, this was worth it for you. Again, I'd like you to check out wagoutloud.com. There is so much there. The weekly podcast, again, it's all about nutrition and health and overall, overall well-being of your dogs. So check that out. We have an amazing community, more fantastic events like this and other resources. So uh, I invite you guys to be part of the Wag Out Loud posse. All right. So we're getting some great, oh, Jim saying thank you. Dalen saying thank you. Derek thought this was fantastic, especially the tones. So uh, thanks again to everybody for being here. Steve, if you can hang on just a few more minutes, we have three more questions. Sure will, yes. And we will wrap up. Okay, Dawn wants to know, she said, what happens if you have a terrier and they ignore any tone? Um, yeah, so you gotta remember that um, sometimes, um, you know, tone can be, needs to be audible. So this is a conditioning thing, Dawn, and I know exactly what you're saying. So. Um, I, I have one right here, and I'm going to use some tone to bring them up. Not that that's an example for you. So, so hey, Peanut, up, up, up. So, up, 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 Ariba. Oh, you're slow moving, slow moving. So, this guy right here is a, mm -hmm, thank you, buddy. thank you, is a Staffordshire. So, when this guy was um, was uh, scheduled, right, to be put down, this is a uh, cat killing, people biting teenager chasing community nuisance, right? And and, and now he's uh, a sweetheart, lover, dever, therapy, therapy guy. It takes um, time and events, Don, time and events. So I want to beat around the bush, but so terriers are um, strong-willed, right? Body-driven. So we got to be able to um, build that relationship. So your tone is going to have to be very differentiated. And a lot of times... Um, Sometimes, right? So women are way better at praise, both their timing and their tone. And men sometimes are quicker and more effective because they're because of the, their tone with um, with corrections. So Don, I'm gonna encourage you first of all, you gotta separate these as far as you can, right? So um, well, he's still not gonna respond. Then um, we gotta we gotta synchronize or condition the dog that your verbal correction first it has to be one syllable stable, but really harsh. Right, really correctional and unpleasant, and we may have to teach you how to um, synchronize that with a touch of the dog. He needs your love, and I don't mean love. I mean, you know, he needs your he needs your love. He needs you to bring him out of there. Um, dogs that are fixated, they have um, stress and anxiety. Um, th that's not their natural state. That's not their happy place. Right. So if we can help you to love and lead that dog, get asserted neurologically and get this dog. So get this dog back back on here. Right. So he has no social responsibility. Right. No stress, no anxiety. Um, he can live right here. And when he sees some some things, um, you know, before he gets before he goes there neurologically, he can see something and look to you. I mean, that is going to be a happy, happy, happy dog. Just like this guy here um, who's. Sound asleep already again, right? So um, dogs, all dogs, including terriers, in, in the strongest terriers, right? Including, including the, the pit bulls, um, they need social order and, and leadership. 
and what Speak Dog is all about is teaching someone like you, like you with a, a dog like that how to do that. It will take consistency and a commitment from you. Um, your dog is waiting for it. I promise you. All right. Okay. Uh, the other ones were not questions. They were just uh, fill in the blanks for, right. <laughs> from my um, giveaways. Okay. So before we go, JB, Dawn, and Derby, please email me with your address so we can get those autographed books out to you. That's Krista at mm -hmm. wagoutloud.com. I want to thank Steve again for being here. And thanks to all of you for taking the time out today. Um, now we encourage you to go be the leader that your dog so desperately needs and have a tail wagging day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Krista. It's great being here. Bye-bye, everyone.